Um, welcome to church. Welcome uh, to gathering. Um, if you are new, you should have received a wee little card with a chocolate on it. Um, if you haven't, just please raise a hand. We'll get one to you at some point. Scanning, scanning, scanning. Complete. Awesome. Um, heads up, this is fresh off the press. We've got a car with a flashing indicator outside, apparently, um, or hazard lights. Rego, Rego, license plate, MEP447. Uh, so heads up on that. Yeah, a few bra uh, breathing a sigh of relief. Um, <laughs> ah, awesome. <laughs> you just got to own it, haven't you? You can't do the subtle shuffle, can you? You just got to own it. Yeah, good on you, mate. Um, there is no Sunday service on Boxing Day at the moment. Um, well, not at the moment. There will be no Sunday service on Boxing Day on the first two Sundays of January. However, there are still ice creams on the second two Sundays of January, so I would assume that's double scoops. I'm just going to put it out there. Yeah. It was a big yes from Mike. Big yes. Ice cream fan. Um, sadly, church dinner on the 10th has had to be um, cancelled um, because of all the traffic light stuff. Um, so, yeah, we're pretty gutted about that, but that's the way it is, unfortunately. Uh, next week, Jan and Andrew, we are having a, um, an offering for them. Uh, the missionaries we support, part of our church family, great people. Um, so just a heads up on that. Next Sunday, we'll be taking up our, our annual offering for them. And then next Sunday, we've got a baptism. And if you would like to be baptized too, you're interested about being baptized, you know Jesus, you love Jesus, and you, you follow him, but you're not baptized yet, we'd love to talk to you. We'd love to um, just explain what that might mean. And yeah, if you're keen, we'd love to, to get that set up for you. Cool. John. Over to you, my friend. John's going to lead us in some communion. All closed. It's a really holy moment. Morning. First morning that we meet under these new rules and regulations and it's a bit of a challenge for us because it's a bit of a change and how we work through it but I'm sure we will. Uh, history's full of challenges for the church and uh, the Apostle Paul wrote a bunch of letters to the churches which guide us even today about how we approach things and what we do and I just want to pick up on on Galatians 3, one we point that he made that I think is very relevant for us today. For you are all sons and daughters of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, and there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, and there is neither male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And that applies to us today, and I thought it was interesting because this knows no boundaries, it knows no physical location that's exclusive, and so I see it applies to us in this room, it applies to the people who are meeting out in the uh, garden lounge, and it even applies to people anywhere, people who are at home, maybe watching on the internet today. They are still one with us in Christ. And the other little point where he said about there's neither Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female, but we're all one in Christ. And I looked at this list of different types of people and I realized that these people would have different world views, different ideas, different race and, and creed and understanding. And, and yet, he said, doesn't matter because the important thing is we are one in Christ. And that overrules these things, that there is a, there's a powerful thing that we are one in Christ and it is more powerful than all the other little things that we uh, may allow to worry us and concern us. And so I, I would like us to consider these things and um, just spend a bit of time thinking about them and just um, meditating upon them as you take the cup. So I'd like people to come now and take a cup and participate in Your love surrounds me with no end in sight Mercy falling if I cross the line Okay. 
get to see But I will believe it I will believe it You make mountains move You make giants fall You use songs of praise To shake prison walls And I will speak to my fear
Liam uh, was youth pastoring at Kashmir New Life for quite a few years in town. Um, really, really stoked to have you here, mate. Um, he's, he's a real observant chap, this Liam. He watched our AGM last week. He's been praying. He's been stewing. I think we spoke a few months ago about what might be good to talk about, and he's talking about something completely different, which is great, because uh, he's really been listening to God. And yeah, it was funny when... Um, when we set this up a few months ago, I didn't realize, or we both didn't realize it would be this Sunday that he gets. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, thanks, mate. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, honestly, like, Liam is a really warm-hearted fella. Um, we had him speak at our joint youth camp last year. And I don't know how you did it, but I think he was on first name terms with probably about two-thirds of the hundred people there by, I don't know, after two days. Uh, so just real warm, really um, pastoral, but very insightful. Um, and just completely respected and also likes on the youth pastor scene. So, yeah, great to have you with us, mate. Can I pray before we kick off? Right. Awesome. Do you want the whiteboard as well or TBC? We'll All right, we'll figure it out. Yeah. Cool, let's just pray, guys. <sighs> Thank you, God. Thank you, God, um, for being church. Thank you for Liam and our brothers and sisters at Kashmir New Life. And we just thank you that Liam's here today. We just ask that you would fill him with your spirit, that he would know that he's just sharing with the family, and that we would have ears to hear as well, God. Please just show us and reveal to us what you want to say to us. Amen. 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 Test thing. Here we go. Awesome. Hey, great to be here. Don, it's super exciting, man, that you're getting released to, to do what your heart feels called into, like more fully. Um, and yeah. Cool to be here. I hope Seb hasn't set the expectations too high. Just think about my height is probably about accurate. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a real privilege to be here this morning. Seb asked me a while ago. Um, f- some of my history, I guess, is I got to know Seb through the youth ministry, through, through youth work. I was involved at Cashman New Life and still involved there, but just not in an employment basis. Um, and also with youth work at Cashmere High. And uh, I just finished that up in the middle of this year. Um, and just felt like it was sort of a time for a season to finish uh, in that area of my life. And I've just started a building apprenticeship. And so 
yeah, just a little bit about who, who I am. I'm, I was born in Nelson in 1988. Good year, I'm sure some of you were around then. Um, and grew up there as a pastor's kid, so I'm a typical pastor's kid. Went off the rails a little bit and then came back to finding Jesus for myself. And then we moved to Christchurch in 98 and, uh, and have lived there ever since, really, and now called Christchurch home. Um, I'm married to Monique, she's awesome, and, and then got three little kids, Gus, who's four, Bobby, she's three, and Frank, he's one, and, uh, and they keep me pretty busy. They actually got a hold of my notes this morning and started scribbling out a bit of stuff. So if I'm kind of squinting and trying to read through scribbles, then you know why that is, eh? Obviously, we live in some pretty crazy times at the moment, eh? To say there's a lot of uncertainty would probably be an understatement. You know, we're surrounded by lots of different opinions that people have. There's a deep sense of fear that affects our uncertainty. Struggling to find and defend our confidence causes us to butt heads with other people and their opinions. There's a distrust of others and distrust of society, our government, or lots of different things. There's this sense of uneasiness that provokes a defensiveness to try and find our sense of confidence and stability, our security. Sometimes it feels the only certainty is uncertainty for us. I remember as a kid growing up in Nelson, we lived up Marsden Valley in Stoke there, and we lived on the Christian school property because the church that my dad was pastor at, they owned one of the houses there, and that was kind of like the manse. Eh? And up behind us was this awesome hill covered in gorse bushes, and we used to put on our bush jackets, and we would crawl on our tummies up through these tiny little tunnels in the brown prickly gorse, and we would have the time of our lives as kids. We would find these passion fruit vines and we would sit up in these trees and eat passion fruit all day. And then we would make our way back home at dinner time. We lived right next door to some of our best friends. And anyway, when I was little and I needed to get up to go to the toilet at night and it was dark, this is how I would do it. Wake up, jump out of bed, sprint to the toilet as fast as I could. Bang, hit the lights on, we're away. I'm really enjoying having two hands free, this is really good. Just hit the lights on, and I'm like, later. And then it's time to go back to bed. Flick the lights off, sprint back to bed. Now, my brother had a friend coming around, and he's going to stay the night. And my mum had the idea of, why don't you guys go up in the gorse at night when it's dark? Whoa, good idea, eh? Well, now I'll tell you, if it was me going up there by myself, I probably wouldn't make it past the front door step with the light on. You know, if the light got turned off, I'd probably turn around and sprint straight into the door. But with my brother, there was a sense of excitement and confidence to face that which was a bit uncertain and fearful, wasn't there? You see, my conf- confidence didn't come from what I knew, because I knew, I spent hours up there. I knew exactly what was up there. I knew, exa- but then when it was dark, there's a sense of uncertainty. But my confidence came from who I was with. In July, we took a family holiday on the West Coast, and where we stayed was in this old sort of church building, beautiful sort of um, being turned into a house. And they had made some glowworm caves. And so we got there with our little kids. And we decided we would go and see these glowworm caves on the first night. And so we kept our kids up till it was dark, which is pretty late for them, even though it was winter. And we decided to make our way up to these glowworm caves. And for them, the same thing would be as it was for me. If they were out there by themselves, there would be so much uncertainty for them, a fear of unknown, the dark, the bushes, place that they haven't been before. And yet with mum and dad either side and them in the middle walking off, It was all of a sudden a great adventure that they felt confident and excited about. And we etched our way, and to be honest, I was a little bit scared. We etched our way into this dark cave, 
And then we got to see something beautiful, something of wonder, lights. And for my kids, it wasn't what, you know, their confidence came from being with us, being in between us, the care of their parents. You see, with this uncertain times and and lots of directions, it's not just our current reality with with COVID and, and things like that. It's not just the big stuff, it's the personal uncertainty that no one else knows about. It's those moments that we're seeking to find our confidence, we're seeking to find a sense of stability and security. And what I want us to understand this morning is that our confidence doesn't come from what we know. Our confidence confidence comes from who we know and who we're with. Where we exist and live in between. That's where our confidence comes from. That's the foundation of our faith. It's not the what we know, but the who we are included in. And therefore, where we live, move, breathe, and have our being. Amen? I want to pray, but I'm not going to pray this morning. Jesus is going to pray for us. So we're in John 17, and this is Jesus' prayer for all time. eh? When Jesus prays, he doesn't just pray for a time in history, but his prayer extends space and time to exist as a reality that he calls humanity into. So if you're with us, John 17, verse 20, it's one of my favorite passages of Scripture because Jesus teaches us in this how to pray and what it means to live and that confidence that we are included in relationship with him. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That all of them and all of us, Jesus, may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I and them and you and me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory. The glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. Amen. I want us to consider this morning our learning from a foundation of relationship rather than from a foundation of gathering information. Does that make sense? I remember I got asked once, you know, it was going to a a workshop on discipleship by a youth pastor at the time called Christoph Zintel. Some of you might know of him. But he he said, you know, tell me three sermons that have impacted your life. And I was like, you know, if I really stretched and tried, maybe I could distinguish three sermons and what they actually did to change my life. And then he said, now tell me three people that have changed your life. Instantly, names started coming to my mind about people who had impacted my life. And that's the kind of learning that I want us to lean into this morning as we look at a doctrine of that is core to who we are. You know, when we're in times of uncertainty, we refer back to the Scriptures back to the word of God, back to that sense of what is true regardless of circumstance and situations that remains our sort of, we hold on to it, our doctrines. eh? Those got formed in times of uncertainty. See, what what is it that shapes us and, and is core to our identity is who we are as believers. And so as we lean into some doctrines this morning, I don't want us to lean in from a, from a place of wanting information about it, because unfortunately, giving too much information about it is well above me and the time that we have here together. But actually to lean into it from a place of like willing to learn from a relational foundation, because in that, there's definitely something there for us this morning.
especially in the times that we live right now and the times that we continue to live in. There's something for us in that right now. My in-laws had a dog, and this dog's name was Ludo, and he was a white, fluffy thing. I don't know the exact breed, but I will go with thing. And he was pretty old, eh? He was like 14, sort of 14, 16 when I started to get to know Monique and get to know him. And we would walk him around Rolleston where her parents lived at the time, and he would make a block, and he's like, <laughs> and we're like, shoot, do we need to carry him, you know, to, to get him home safe, and... And anyway, Ludo was starting to, you know, he's starting to get towards the end of his life. And um, Monique's parents decided to get a little puppy. And so they got this little puppy, which is a little brown scruffy thing, uh, potentially like a Norfolk little terrier thingy, if you know, I think, maybe, something like that. And so he gets this little puppy. And, and they get it before Ludo actually dies. You know, he's pretty much gone, but he's still around. And they get this little puppy. And I tell you what. Ludo comes back to life, and he is playing, and he's teaching this little puppy what's up, you know, teaching her to, to, to you know, where her place is in the household. And all of a sudden, Ludo's found this new, new life, this new energy, and this relationship that has happened for him. And he, he hung around for another couple of years. <laughs> or a lot, it might not have been a couple of years, but it was a lot longer than we were expecting. When uh, me and my wife like to watch Netflix and chill sometimes, and we um, watched this program on Netflix just recently called The Old People's Home for Four-Year-Olds. Has anyone seen it? If you're interested in some good watching, it's actually really enjoyable. And so what it is, it's this experiment in Australia where they gather uh, sort of about 10 to 12 old people from, a, from an old folks' home, a veterinarian, veterinarian? a veteran, Forgive me. <laughs> Veterans home. And they gather them for this experiment where they, for seven weeks, they bring in sort of a dozen four-year-old toddlers and they run like a preschool, a kindy type of environment for both the, old, the elderly people and the young. And they run it as an experiment to see if time together and relationship and activity would be beneficial for both the elderly's mental, physical, emotional health, as well as the four-year-olds. Now, there's some pretty well-educated people that are speaking to this, that have dedicated their lives to, to studying elderly and study, studying young people, that are talking you through this. But I tell you what, over seven weeks, the transformation is amazing. You can see it on their faces. They're not, you know, half of these old people were pretty high up a special scale that they call, which I won't try to talk to, around having depression. They didn't see a lot of purpose in life. They didn't have a lot of joy. And yet, in bringing two completely different types of people together in relationship, something happens between that that's very, very hard to make sense of. Life happens between. Something changes when someone is included. You know, often we've excluded our old people from society. And in this program, you see it, that they're kind of isolated and left and forgotten about. And yet somehow a four-year-old walks in and says, Hi! And runs up and greets them, and something starts to change in their heart. And at the end, they interview some of these people, and they present the stats, and I can't do that right now because I don't know them off by heart. But they present that stuff, and it's like the change is, is significant. All of a sudden, they have a new lease on life. They're, they're actively engaging in local preschools just to bless kids like they, they got the chance to. I'd like to encourage you that you're included in Christmas this morning. Our passage this morning is John chapter 1, verse 1. To 18. If you want to open your Bibles and turn there, you can. Hopefully, we've got enough time to keep going. I have a drink while you're turning your Bibles or flicking. John. 
John chapter 1, verse 1. It echoes Genesis chapter 1, the very first words, doesn't it? In the beginning. May we hear that right now. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him, all, everyone say all. All things were made. Without Him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was the life, and that life was the light of all, everyone say all, all All mankind. That light shines into the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John, and he came as a witness to testify concerning that light. So that through him, all, everyone say all, all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world. And though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all, everyone say all, who did receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of a human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory. The glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Out of his fullness, we have all, everyone say all, received grace in the place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father has made him known. This passage reminds us and draws us into the doctrine that is central to who we are and what Jesus has done. This doctrine is named the incarnation, the word becoming flesh. Jesus, both fully human and fully divine in the same person. It's core to who you are. It's core to who I am. It's core to who your neighbor is. It's core to the world in which you live on. It's core to all creation, this doctrine. It transcends whether or not you accept it and believe it. Sometimes I feel like this is a challenge in my own life. Sometimes we make Jesus in our own image. And what we believe him to be, we form our own opinions about him and who's included and who's excluded in him. And sometimes we, 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 make, it, we make Jesus smaller. Often when we hear about a doctrine, we're, we're considered to figure out answers and talk about what it is. But today I'd like us to consider who it is. Now I'm not saying that understanding the what of the incarnation is important. But I'm saying that sometimes we miss the who for the what. Sometimes trying to make sense in forming our opinions and and gathering information about what we can tell people or what we can convince ourselves or find confidence sometimes stops us from finding our true confidence and certainty and and rest in the truth of who it is, and therefore who we are in light of who he is and what he's done. The incarnation's foundation is that it's a relationship. It's a relationship, and you're included in that relationship. 
You're not included based on your believing it or not. You're included in that because it's the work of God and what he's done. You're experiencing it. You're invited to understand and recognize it at work in your heart and life. Our experiencing of it can be based on us. And God works graciously in, even in that, that we might experience it more. But your inclusion in it is a full stop. You're included in Jesus, who he is and what he's done. You're included in Christmas. You were made through him. Without him, nothing has been made. In him was the life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The true light gives light to everyone. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. I want to grab the whiteboard. Ta da! (laughs) When we were In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, eh? (coughs) Excuse me. And he created us in relationship with himself, with each other, with ourselves, and with creation. And so he creates us in perfect relationship. He looks at all his creation and, and adds humanity into that. He looks and goes, it's very good. And yet in our decision, as humans, we find ourselves separated from God, eh? excluded from the garden, and there was consequences to the decisions and choices as humanity made, and that humanity made, and we found ourselves separated, relationships broken, both in relationship with God, we're separated from Him. Relationships broken, there's exclusion and separation here. Relationship with ourself is broken. We have uncertainty and doubt and fear about who we are, about wrong conclusions about our identity and who we are. We have broken creation that's influenced by humanity's decisions and choices. Uh, Does that make sense? And so Jesus, in his incarnation, looks to put right that which was broken. Was Jesus successful? Have you ever considered that question? Because sometimes I think I've lived my life based on my believing or not, whether or not Jesus was successful. But reality is Jesus is successful, isn't he? It doesn't matter if you believe it or not. Jesus is successful in what he set out to do. And it's a continuing, unfolding story, isn't it, that we're a part of, that we're included in, that all humanity is included in. Jesus was successful in this. In bringing back together that which was separated. Sometimes we've made Jesus too small. And we've made him like us. In actual fact, he's brought us together to be included in relationship with him. In the incarnation, we are included in relationship with him. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. The one who's in closest relationship with the Father represented humanity in and of himself and brought those those back together. The incarnation of Jesus' life. He taught us what it means to live well in relationship with others. Those who were rejected in the society that Jesus lived in, what did he do? Accepted them, included them. 
those who are outcast, those that are untouchable, the unclean. The reality of who Jesus is is he included them. He touched them. The incarnation, you're not just included in Christmas. You're included in the life of Jesus, the love of Jesus, the way of Jesus. Not just about the answers that we can give about that, but that's the reality that you're included in. That's the relationship that you're held in, whether you believe it or not, because Jesus was successful. Your experience of that and learning to live in that, that's where life and joy can be experienced for you, but also that influences the experience of the people that you work with. Am I making sense? Good. In some ways, I might not make that much sense. But relationships are hard to, to make sense of sometimes, eh? But there's something that happens in the in-between of that. The in-between of relationship is what I'm trying to talk to. The in-between of this relationship of the divine and humanity brought together in Jesus that now don't live separated, but live included. Live in the oneness of God. The death he died, he died once and for all. He took to the grave this separation that was on us that we might now live in the life that he was resurrected into. One of my biggest revelations recently has been that the incarnation didn't stop when Jesus died. Did it? The incarnation goes beyond Christmas. The incarnation still exists right now because Jesus rose from the grave in his body, didn't he? And he ascended into heaven. He didn't just disappear into thin air. He ascended into heaven in his bodily form. The incarnation of Jesus, Christmas, that which you're included in still remains and he sits at the right hand of the Father and you are still in him. And sometimes I think when we talk about being in Christ, we still talk about it from a sense of information and answers and trying to make sense of it. When actually it's this relationship that we are included in right now that we can understand and experience. You are included right now in Jesus, sitting at the right hand of the Father. And we can live like that. that inf- that's not just something for us to make sense of. That's a relationship that you're in where you can experience the healing, the joy, the life. Kids get this. Kids understand it. Last Sunday, I was at church, and I was just sitting there, and Gus is four, and he kind of comes in halfway through the service and just walks through the front, you know, walks down the middle, and he comes back, and on his way to me, he sees this bowl of chocolate fish. And he goes, comes sit next to me, he goes, Dad, look at that, look at that, look at that. I was like, yeah, yeah, cool, mate, cool, cool, cool. And the message was about the age of cynicism that we live in, you know, and looking and reflecting on that. And in it, it was kind of like, how do you deal with people who are, are, are cyni- cynical and, and like, how do we live and, and help and live in relationship with that? And there was this phrase, kindness, and I'm always trying to teach my kids to be kind. Eh? Anyone who's got toddlers will know that trying to teach them to be kind is like you're on repeat all the time. And I'm like, oh, look, you know, that's how you do it, mate. You, you, you be kind. You know about being kindness. And he looks at the bowl of chocolate fish, and he goes, we're going to celebrate. We're going to celebrate. I was like, okay. And then it was kind of like, how do you practice living in the opposite of cynicism? And what was the next word that came up, you reckon? Celebration. And he was ahead of, he, he, in, a, in a funny way, and I hope that you can see it, he was kind of like, well ahead. He got it. He got the point that actually we are invited to live in this place of celebration. And, and kids get this. Kids get relationship. It makes sense to them. I think Jesus was trying to help people see it. He's like, don't miss it. Kids get it. Don't ever, don't ever underestimate. The kingdom belongs to kids because they get it. They get relationship. They get inclusion. And the Holy Spirit is given to help us realize the fact that we're included in the work and grace of God Almighty revealed in Jesus.
But you're included in this relationship of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. The in-between of that is, is you get to exist within that and help others to recognize, to discover the life, the joy that's in that. We're invited to understand what it means to exist within Christ in closest relationship with the Father. And that's not just here on a Sunday morning. When I live in relationship with my kids and my wife, it's not just when I'm thinking about it that I'm in relationship with them. Is it? It's all the time. And it's the same with Jesus. When we're included in Christ, We're included in relationship with the Father and the Spirit. It's not just when we're conscious about it. It's all the time. And we get to experience that when we're in the workplace and it feels like we're going through the motions. To go, Jesus, help me recognize that I'm in you here right now. Help me me have and express love in a way to my workmates that helps them recognize that you see them and they're included. When Jesus talks about the lost sheep and the lost son and the lost coin, are you familiar with those in Luke, those passages? Does the sheep ever stop being a sheep that belongs to the shepherd? Does the son ever stop being a son that belongs to the father? Does a coin ever stop being a coin that belongs to the woman looking? They still belong, even though they're lost and not with they still exist as part of the whole. In concluding, our challenge is to continue to be open to discovering the in-between of the relationship that we're included in with Jesus. To find our confidence not in the what we know, but in the who we're with. To live in such a way that invites others to experience that relationship as well. And there's a few things that I think we can practice that help us live in this place of relationship well. And to be fair, I think they're actually pretty simple. Some things that I would encourage you to consider practicing to understand the relationship you live in. One is gratitude. Having a grateful heart to others around you and to the God in which sustains you and gives you life. The one and through whom you're made and who you're included in. The other one would be serving. Doing things for others. Because that's the same relationship that you're included in of a God who gives you life, who served you to the point of costing his own life. And then the final one, Jesus majored on pretty strongly, and it's forgiveness. I think as I've as I reflected more and more on who Jesus is and what he's done for us, I think one of the things that keeps bringing me back to this is forgiveness. And the key part is the forgiveness of other people. Now, one of those things when you've been in youth work a while, you start to meet people again, and, and they come back around to you. Eh? And one of my sort of realizations, revelations, I think, is that relationship is eternal. Relationship's eternal, and when it finishes on good terms, I cannot see someone for three, four years, and then you'll see them again, and relationship can take off from exactly the same place it left, if it was finished on good terms. If it wasn't finished on good terms, you might see them in the supermarket and you feel awkward, they feel awkward, and you kind of avoid each other, right? But if relationship finishes on good terms, it will take off from where it left. It's like something has been happened that will remain. And that's why I think Jesus made us so much on forgiveness. Because if we're included in this relationship of God, we're forgiven and brought into this relationship with a loving Father through the Son by the Holy Spirit. 
And yet, who are we to, in our unforgiveness, keep someone else from that? Who are we in our unforgiveness to keep ourselves from experiencing and living in that? Those would be three things that I would encourage you to practice. Because practice takes it from sort of ideas and information into something that goes, I can be great, I can be grateful at work. I can serve others at work. And I can forgive those at work. I can be grateful in my house. I can serve others in my house, and I can forgive those in my house. It's not limited. Those practices aren't limited to I have to gather in a space with everyone to practice those things. Hey, that's a living practice. I'd like us to listen to the words as the band may become. And I'd like us to listen to the words of Jesus' prayer again. And then I might say a wee prayer too. Back in John 17, verse 20. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us. So that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I and them and you and me. So that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am, to see my glory the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you. And they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. Jesus, we hear your words. We thank you for that love. We thank you that you included us in that. Lord, would you continue to make that known in our hearts this morning, the weeks that are ahead, the days that are ahead, the years that are ahead. May we find our certainty in you, who you are, what you've done. May that bring rest to weary souls, Jesus, that it's not based on our abilities to make sense of it all, but it's based on the love that you have for us. It's based on what you've done. It's based on who you are. Reveal that to our hearts continually, God. Holy Spirit, I ask for wisdom and revelation. For each and every person here this morning. Of that relationship with which they are included in you. May we find confidence to live in the uncertainty. Because of who we're with and who's with us. Let's pray your blessing this morning. On every heart, mind, soul that they might know you more and in that know who they are to be. Jesus' holy name.